is a special place, and so are the many people who have joined in its restoration, all of whom are volunteers. What I have learned is that there is a tremendous effort being made to restore the Maley Prairie and to connect it back to its community. When I decided to feature Maley Prairie on Nature Revisited, I felt the traditional interview just wouldn't work. I asked Amy Chamberlain, who is the Outreach and Education Coordinator for Maley Prairie, and whom I have gotten to know, if she would be interested in having those who are involved with Maley Prairie share what they are doing and why it matters. Amy loved the idea. Over the summer, Amy has been gathering and sending me recordings of conversations, shared thoughts and memories, and the history of Maley Prairie. Here is Maley Prairie in their own words. My name is Stefan Van Norden, and this is Nature Revisited. Where's Prairie? That's what I wondered when I moved to Prairie du Sac, Wisconsin over two decades ago. But it didn't take me long to assume that all traces of the sprawling, verdant grassland from which the community takes part of its name had probably been plowed up or built upon long ago. Even then I knew that only a small fraction of the upper Midwest's original prairie had survived the waves of European immigrants that surged westward in the latter half of the 19th century. Eventually, I learned that fragments of the Sauk Prairie, which is what early white settlers called the 14,000-acre grassland they found between the Wisconsin River and the bluffs and the coulees of the Driftless region, had survived. The largest of those remnants, and the one my wife Amy and I have become most familiar with, has been hidden in plain sight to all but a few locals for generations. Maley Prairie, named for the Swiss pioneer family that still owns the land, is a 23 and a half acre sand prairie at the western edge of the village. This remnant survives thanks to the foresight of Barbara Maley who in 2015 placed a perpetual conservation easement on the property, and to her farming ancestors, who used the land to graze a few horses, but never plowed it. Therefore, dozens of native plant species persisted, including prairie smoke, American pasque flower, eastern prickly pear cactus, rough blazing star, lead plant, little blue stem grass, and Indian grass. Barbara knew that her gift to the community and to future generations would mean little if it were not cared for, so she entrusted the restoration and management of Maley Prairie to the Prairie Enthusiasts, a conservation organization dedicated to restoring prairies and oak savannas throughout the Upper Midwest. This is Barbara Maley. The 24-acre field along Highway PF, now known as Maley Prairie, has been in my family for more than 100 years. The property was first homesteaded in 1848, when the land in that area was open for settlement. It changed hands several times until it was purchased in 1880 by William Shepister and his wife, Elizabeth Maley Shepister, my great aunt. In 1889, they sold the property to Elizabeth's uncle, Martin Maley, my great-great-uncle, and his wife, Amelia. Martin and Amelia then sold it to my grandfather, Andrew Maley, in 1892. With the 1892 purchase, Andrew established the Maley Farm on Highway 12, about a mile from what we now know as Maley Prairie. My father, John Maley, became the owner of the farm in the prairie in 1943. The prairie land wasn't useful for farming, as part of it was a sandy hillside, and another part was a low area that got soaked in summer rains, so the land was mostly ignored. In 1970, after my father died, I inherited the farm and the prairie. 
I wanted for many years to find a way to protect the prairie from development, as I could see that the village of Prairie de Sac was gradually extending out to the west. I liked the natural look of the land with little cedar trees, wild cherry trees, and prairie flowers. I didn't really recognize its value as a natural prairie, and I hadn't any idea of how to go about saving it. In 1998, I came home to Wisconsin for my Prairie du Sac high school class reunion. Several things happened during that visit. First, I met Dr. Donald Kinchy, who is an advocate for prairies and had done a great deal of conservation work in the area. He drove me around to see some of the prairie land he had helped develop and tried to educate me about what a prairie is and why it is important. Later that week, I attended an afternoon get-together at the home of Ted Savitas. I got to talking with his son, Larry, about my tour with Dr. Kinchy. Larry worked for the State Department of Natural Resources and knew our prairie very well. He actually had harvested the seeds of wildflowers there, and he encouraged my interest in preserving the land. He put me in touch with Steve Swenson at the Leopold Foundation in Baraboo. Steve and his colleagues at Leopold started work on the land, including a burn, but they had a lot of other projects, so Steve introduced me to Rich Henderson of the Prairie Enthusiasts. We worked out a formal agreement, by which I donated a conservation easement to the Prairie Enthusiasts. This provided the protection I wanted for the land, but it has done a great deal more. I knew from long ago that I wanted to preserve the prairie land. I never imagined all the ways in which it would become a part of the Sauk Prairie community, with high school students doing scientific observation projects, building signage, learning about animals, plants, and history from the land. I am very grateful to the Prairie enthusiasts, to Amy Chamberlain and her family for all their work and enthusiasm, and to the people of Sauk Prairie for embracing this small piece of Wisconsin history and making it so beautiful, so genuine, and so valuable. I hope it will continue to belong to the community for generations to come. When the early French explorers visited here in the 17th century, they gave the place a name that meant Meadow of the Sack, and the name stuck. Indeed, the Sack, or Sauk people, had a large, well-ordered village here, but they were not the first Native Americans to live here. Like so many eastern tribes, the Sauk had been forced out of their homelands by European expansion, and they were eventually pushed further west and south into Iowa, Oklahoma, and Kansas. It is the Ho-Chunk people who claim this area as part of their ancestral homeland. The people of the sacred voice, as they call themselves, trace their connection to this land back thousands of years. Although there is no written record of it, the Ho-Chunk and their progenitors probably helped to create and maintain the prairie by burning it. Lightning simply did not strike often enough to set the prairie ablaze and keep trees from overtaking it. Back then, the Sauk Prairie supported herds of elk and other large animals. The diverse mix of tender green shoots that sprang up after the fires, drew the ungulates and other game animals, and made foraging for berries and roots and farming easier for native peoples. Over millennia, dozens of species of fire-dependent plants thrived and evolved. My name's Brandon Mann. I'm uh, the newly minted site steward for Maley Prairie. So Maley is uh, the largest remnant of Sauk Prairie, which at the time of the government surveys in the 1830s was mapped as an approximately 14,000 acre prairie between the Baraboo Hills to the north and the Wisconsin River to the east and south. The, the surveyors were defining prairie as basically areas with zero trees. And so this was a very open landscape. Um, we're on some glandy, uh, glacial outwash soil, so these soils are also very well drained. And so we get, we get a type of prairie here called sand prairie. Now there's maybe some more mesic, deeper soil pockets here and there on some low spots and then some terraces closer to the Wisconsin River. But I know Maley wasn't plowed. In a situation with a prairie, which is fire dependent this far east, without fire, 
this would quickly fill back in with trees and become scrub and then mature forest. So you have first have to preserve it, but in a prairie, then you have to move on to management to keep it prairie. Fire, like I said, is the main ecological driver, and unless you're introducing fire, you're not preserving anything. True. But in this case, what we're doing is restoring a prairie because we had the original sod, we had the original plants. There may not have been as many because it was brushed in with, with trees and brush and getting shaded, but now that those have been removed, they're coming back. And we're reintroducing species that are appropriate to the site and that were likely here. So that's a, that's a restoration. Mm -hmm. And so from a conservation biology standpoint, you wanna preserve what's left to preserve the biodiversity you have that doesn't mean it will always stay exactly the same and static. It will still change and then it will run its course. We're not trying to recreate ex things exactly how they were in 1820. That's impossible. And even in 1820, that prairie was not the same as it was in 1620. Sure. That's and it a wasn't good point. the same as it was in 1420. Mm -hmm. One of the great things about Mealy Prairie and prairies in general, especially our remnant prairie, is that we are home to about 185 native plants, which means this prairie blooms from early April until October. So I really like to think of Maley Prairie as just sort of one big orchestral piece blooming throughout the summer and into the fall uh, with those final notes ending on asters and goldenrod. And we look forward at the end of the year to the beginning of the next musical performance. Prairies, we have learned, provide feasts not only for the eyes, but for all the sensory organs. Here, inhale the lemony aroma of gray-headed coneflower seed. Lay a few violet wood sorrel leaves on your tongue and experience the tang of Granny Smith apple. Few things will feel softer between your fingers than the downy seed pappus of thimbleweed or world milkweed as you offer it up to the breeze. That sweet symphony you hear? That's a brown thrasher, drawing on his repertoire of over 1,100 songs. 1,100 songs! Thrashers often raise their first broods of the year in our winter brush piles. Prairie is important and worth saving, scientists tell us, because it is a refuge for rare and declining species of plants and animals, ground nesting birds like eastern and western meadowlarks and grasshopper sparrows have declined precipitously in Midwestern states in recent decades. Habitat degradation and loss are a primary reason. The sharp drop in insect numbers worldwide may be another factor. Healthy prairies are pollinator havens, and this alone may be enough reason to do everything we can to preserve and restore them. So I don't know that you're gonna be able to pick this up in the background, but as I'm out here on an early Sunday morning, I'm picking up the call of an Eastern meadowlark now, for those who know prairies, this may not seem like an important discovery, but what's really exciting for us is that Mealy Prairie is only 23 and a half acres. So our most recent bird survey done by Mike Mossman just about a month ago, we're really not drawing in many of the grassland birds that a prairie of a greater size would draw, including meadowlarks, grasshopper sparrows, clay-colored sparrows, and others. So the fact that I'm sitting here at the prairie today and hearing an eastern meadowlark calling is extremely exciting for us. You know, as I was driving here, I realized that you probably have known this land longer than any of us, given that you came out in 1983 and did your first bird survey on Maley Prairie. Yeah, in 83, I was working for the Department of Natural Resources and one of my projects was to look up all the sites in which this bird, the loggerhead shrike, had nested in recent decades. And the loggerhead shrike is a really 
neat bird because it's a predatory songbird and it's about the size of a blue jay and it feeds on insects, large insects and sometimes small birds and small mammals and will provision them by sticking them onto a thorn. So they, were, they would have naturally been a bird of the prairie where it would uh, impale its prey after they had killed it and then come back and get it when, when it was needed. I was out and I'd play my little calls of shrikes and walk around and then in the meanwhile I would uh, you know, listen for all the other birds and, and, and record what I had, uh, in my notes what I'd find. So I came here in May that year and I didn't find any shrikes. I didn't really expect to. They are pretty much all gone. But what I did find out here was like five metal larks mm. and uh, <laughs> lots of clay-colored sparrows or grasshopper sparrows, vesper sparrows, and there was even there was a western metal lark. And you know, grassland birds, especially this, all the species that are declining as a result of these changes in agricultural practices, forest succession, all these things are contributing to the loss of, of grassland made all these grassland birds like the shrike and all those other ones more and more rare. You had a meadowlark show up here this year, which I think we is did. wonderful. So I guess that's one of my questions, you know, if, because periodically too, not this year, but like last year and the year before, we heard clay-colored sparrows out here. Mm -hmm. If meadowlarks and clay-colored sparrows and other more prairie-specific birds are not necessarily nesting here because the landscape isn't perhaps large enough to provide them what they're looking for. Is a place like Mealy Prairie still beneficial in terms of for feeding and, uh -huh. you know, other activities? Yeah, on migration, yeah. you know, the birds can have a place to, to come through and, and feed and hang out. Yeah, I think it is, and especially when, you, when it's part of a, although it might not be directly connected to other grasslands, it's part of a string of uh, grassland but I think the one thing that's really important about someplace like Mailey is that it's so important for education, for interpretation and to study and learn about it. I mean, there's a lot of good lessons about that, about restoration, about the diversity of life that you can have in a place like this where you've, where you've managed to bring back this, this uh, native prairie. And so people understand what it is. You know, when I was a kid, uh, I remember seeing monarch butterflies everywhere. Oh, like uh -huh. they were just everywhere. It was a, a known that you would see them. But my memory of lots of monarchs and then now seeing the sharp decline probably affects me more than the kids who this is their normal. I feel like we are sort of historians in a way to remind people that this isn't the way it's always been. Right. The great majority of the high school students we lead in restoration work, or who join with us to do citizen science, had previously never set foot in a prairie, despite living in a community and a school district with prairie as part of its name. If anything, popular culture probably gave them an anemic, if not inaccurate idea of what prairie is. Even more gratifying, than the ecological restoration for me is seeing prairie restored to its rightful place in these kids. As with the physical restoration work, it requires investments of time and patience, some art and some science, and plenty of trial and error. The dividends are returned to us in the form of eyes and mouths wide with surprise and wonder. To our own surprise and delight, a few of our kids have even gone on to pursue degrees in environmental science and have told us that their time on the prairie put them on that path. So I'm out here today on Mealy Prairie with some of our Sauk Prairie High School students. They have been volunteering with us for the last five Wednesdays as a part of the school system's effort to return to complete in-person learning. I'm here with two of our high school students. You had lots of opportunities of activities to choose. Why did you pick to come out to Mealy Prairie on Wednesdays? Um, I just thought it was a nice hands-on outdoor activity rather than being stuck in class. Just wanted to like get outside and like see nature and just experience some of the beauty around Sauk. 
Given your experience out here, was there anything that surprised you about Mealy Prairie or prairies in general of anything that we talked about while you were out here? Well, I just learned what was native and what was not native. And I didn't even know that Mealy Prairie was like in Sauk. Like I didn't know where it was and I kind of just drove by it all the time. Something that surprised me was how much diversity is in a prairie. Cause I don't think I ever appreciated like how much really goes on like in a prairie. What is it meant to you to spend time out here restoring a remnant prairie? Um, I think it's cool just to see the progress that we've made throughout like these past months. And it's gonna be cool to see it like in a few years to see like what it looks like then. Good morning, Mr. Lee. Good morning. <laughs> I see um, you and I are both supporting Sock Prairie High School today in our red shirts. Yep. I love coming out here. It is nice out in the morning. Yeah. For sure. All the grass is full of dew and you know, one of the reasons, well, the main reason I wanted to talk with you is because you and the Sock Perry High School have been such an important part of getting Mailey Prairie started in terms of community outreach and, and education. Um, one of the things I've come to realize in my teaching is that it's, it's not so much about, you know, what they read in a book, it's relationships and experiences. In one of the presentations you gave to the class, you talked about how you and Rick had come out the summer before and, mm -hmm. and did some things and it was really neat. And you said you kind of shied away from a couple of the projects because of the manpower. We could, you know, maybe provide some people hours there. Can, can we get in on this? And I, I remember being a little bit nervous that you would say, no, we're, we kind of got this, we're, <laughs> we're good. And I, uh, so I was really happy to, with how open you were to say, yeah, bring bring kids in. That would yes. be awesome. It would be great. <laughs> I, I don't know that all of the students see that value quite yet, but they they will. We we thought about, you know, involving students out here in just monarch monitoring. You know, by no means do we expect kids to suddenly have this aha moment and change their entire career to biology. It seems like perhaps we've got a few kids coming through who want to pursue science yeah. uh, related fields and that's just entirely exciting to me. I think in the end what we hope what we hope to instill is just an appreciation for the land and that's something that they can take forward in their adult lives and pass along to their families and their children. And it's that relation to the land that at bare minimum, I hope that we instill. And I, I hope to that relationship with the land that we can instill not just that, but how special Sauk Prairie is in regards to the land. It, and it, it is a really special place. Yeah. And I hope kids realize that. I hope, I hope we can bring them to that epiphany. So where is Prairie? It's there, in those young eyes and hearts and minds, as well as below our feet and in our hands as we do restoration and science together. And that answers almost as well the other question I started with. Prairie is a complex relationship between species, our own included. It always has been. But today, our relationship with prairie has never been more important. say if someone told you a plant you were standing in front of at Mealy Prairie has likely been there for centuries, yet has never grown taller than three feet. This fact would certainly raise a few eyebrows, and it certainly raised mine when I learned about it. I'm talking about lead plant. It's found blooming in patches throughout Mealy Prairie starting in late June its main root can grow 15 feet into the ground and thus can readily survive our controlled burns out here. 
Its mere presence on Mealy is really a positive indication of the original high quality of our remnant site. But it's really the lead plant flowers that are the showstoppers, in my opinion, especially when you stop to inspect them up close. From afar, they seem stocky, kind of a deep purple. But when you look at them closely, that deep purple flower is the perfect backdrop for these bright orange stamen. So you have these contrasting colors of purple and almost a deep orange that just is nothing like you'll see anywhere else. So as you can imagine, the flowers of lead plant attract a wide variety of long-tongued bees, short-tongued bees, wasps, butterflies, which make lead plant vitally important to the prairie food web. I think it's nice to be reminded that we may not be the oldest beings out here on the prairie. Another wonderful plant that is found among the 185 native species on Mealy Prairie is called prairie sinkfoil. It, like lead plant, tends to be found in high quality habitats, reminding us once again how lucky we are to have this true piece of remnant prairie in our community. This is Amy out on Maley Prairie on a very humid late day in June. And I've situated myself within a large patch of common milkweed. And while I'm here, I'm gonna take a look and see if I see any monarch eggs or instars. But I just wanna take a minute to say that when the milkweed bloom, as they are starting to do now, they emit just the most delicious smell on the planet. I will take my little chair and plop myself down and wait for pollinators and just drink in this awesome decadent smell that only lasts about a week. The other day I was out on the fringe of our prairie as I always do, I check milkweed to see if I can find any eggs or instars. And while I was inspecting this patch of common milkweed, a monarch butterfly flew up and landed on a very, very small, not even yet flowering milkweed, not even a foot in front of me. And because I was so close, I was able to watch her actually deposit her egg directly on this milkweed leaf. I've certainly taken lots of pictures in the past of monarchs ovipositing. So the fact that this monarch landed at my feet basically allowed me to watch her lay her egg on this tiny milkweed was a miracle I had never witnessed before. Stefan, I'm here with your friend, Kurt Miney, and uh, we're gonna talk about Mealy Prairie in his eyes. I do remember a couple springs when you could really see the prairie smoke in its glory here, and this, as you know, Amy, this place is just phenomenal when it comes to that particular species. So we began to understand that this was a spot, and others had noticed Mealy Prairie before, but there was not much, you know, in terms of uh, sustained attention to it. But we also knew from other prairie work that if we could get a handle on it, there's a lot we can do that would come right back. But we were also busy with so many other things that it was kind of scattershot efforts until you and Rick and your gang came along and began to put your shoulder to it. And it's just extraordinary now to sit here and look and see just how beautiful and diverse and alive and healing this place has become in these years since. And also, how more, much more visible it is to the community. As much as we're putting our shoulder, as you said, into the restoration, we're also doing our best to educate the community about this space and about what you know our area looked like, likely, before all this development. And especially among the neighborhood that this prairie adjoins, you know, just to 
help them understand how important this piece of land is, how rare this piece of land is, and what a gem it is, even among other remnant prairies in our area. To have the living example of the dominant landscape ecological community of this part of the country, literally in the backyard. That's that visceral feeling for, wow, there's something deeper. And so what is what does this place do for, you know, anyone who might wander in here or see you working out here or maybe come out as a volunteer even more? It can transform lives. And it has to do with that, that flipping of a switch where you kind of enter a new consciousness about place and meaning and your identity and your history and your sense of where you are and where you belong and how you interact with the world around you. Prairies are resilient to some of the worst ravages of the climate crisis. Recent research even suggests that in temperate zones, prairies may be better at long-term carbon sequestration than forests because most of their carbon remains underground in the form of roots, and root growth is stimulated by fire. The ecological importance of prairies is undisputed, even if it is not as widely recognized as we would like. What I've come to understand and appreciate at least as much, if not more, since beginning our work on Maley Prairie, though, is the psychological and spiritual value of prairie. It is something that gets to the heart of the questions, where is prairie? And what is prairie? Prairie is so rooted in my psyche that it is not hyperbole to say that a world without it is now as unimaginable to me as a world without forests or rivers or mountains. Yes, the future of prairie depends on people working with nature to preserve and restore remnant prairies like Maley Prairie just as people help to create them. That involves invasive species control, interceding, prescribed burns, collaborating with neighbors and policymakers, and other things. But I now believe those efforts will ultimately fail if we don't also restore prairie to the consciousness of people. You and I both have said that there's a certain spirituality to these lands, but also this sense that this land is sacred. How do you describe it, or where do you think it it comes from? Yeah. Prairies have always been special in that way for me, and I don't know what it is. Maybe it's the openness, the sense of the open sky in prairie. And then when you look at, let's take that prairie smoke again, I know that this place is a seed source for others. <laughs> so the genetic value of this spot is another thing we haven't even talked about is every patch has its own unique genetic legacy. Yeah. And we don't have enough. We have, and, and others will tell you this. Our little mini patches of prairie, our little postage towns have, have gone away. They've blinked out over the years in Sauk County and in the southern Wisconsin and in the mid-continent. And every one of them contains unique, special, locally adapted genetic value. Having these opportunities everywhere and anywhere are important as well. You know, what, what can people do in our community, close to Maley Prairie, but anywhere? Like, how can somebody do something small and manageable to help? If you're fortunate enough to have piece of land like this or park or refuge. If you're lucky enough to have that, it makes it a little easier for sure. But I'm also strongly part of that view that says conservation isn't just about the places we deem protected. That all land is sacred and all land deserves to be respected and taken care of. And that extends from our largest, most remote wild places that are remaining to our most urbanized, humanized spots. No matter where we are on the landscape, there's something to do. Um, if we're anywhere from that on that spectrum, from the most wild to the most urban and human place, 
and we need it all and we need to connect them across that landscape and every little bit we do helps to expand beyond what the boundaries of the little protected place may be so that it gets woven in it's not just this dramatic shift from this is controlled dominated human landscape to this is wild yeah. maybe we can begin to soften that boundary line and begin to integrate the wild into our human places while we do our best to protect and restore the wildness that remains. When my in-laws, Paul and Robin, moved to Prairie du Sac and bought a home next to Maley Prairie in 2015, Paul wanted to know more about the property because I had volunteered to help burn brush piles at Maley a few winters earlier I knew enough to put Paul in touch with someone who knew more. Soon, Paul and I were volunteering several hours each week to liberate the prairie from exotic shrubs and native but encroaching trees. We worked under the watchful gaze of a septuagenarian named Denny, Maley's site steward at the time, and a rough-edged veteran of many restoration projects. As we worked and wandered around the rolling remnant that is Maley Prairie, we encountered flora and fauna that exploded our conceptions of what prairie is. Prairies, we have come to learn, are living kaleidoscopes, a fragrant, teeming, buzzing, colorful, and biologically rich collage that shifts as the planet revolves around the sun and as weather soil chemistry, and our restoration work act on it year into year. Just sitting here with my dad after a day uh, working on the prairie. I moved in here a little over five years ago, right next door to Maley Prairie. And it's been a journey of discovery. Originally, we had to push our way through six foot tall honeysuckle and buckthorn just to get to the prairie. What we thought was the prairie really didn't know anything at all about what needed to be done, what could be done, if anything. So the first discovery is what is an invasive? Second discovery was that many of the trees needed to come down because a prairie does not have trees. It's been now a discovery of what is a prairie plant. It was interesting to realize that this prairie is never plowed. And so these plants go back 10,000 years. It's humbling and it's eye-opening. Even today, we found a new plant out there. And so what's this plant? Is it native? Does it belong here? Will it survive into the future? Are all questions we ask as we find the plants and we add to the inventory. This year, National Prairie Day falls on June 1st. But in our opinion, every day feels like National Prairie Day at Mealy Prairie. And we certainly hope our advocacy raises a bit of public awareness to what prairie is, its value, and also that it motivates all of us to support prairie protection, conservation, and restoration. We celebrate and encourage discussion, whether it be on our social media page or through community outreach, discussion around the historic and current value of prairie and to recognize the vital importance of conserving the original prairie that remains like Remnant Maley Prairie, while also reconstructing native grasslands. When I started doing restoration work on Maley Prairie four years ago, I had just retired from a 27 year career as a lieutenant for a large urban police department. When I left my career, I wasn't exactly sure what I was gonna do to occupy my days. I was excited to enjoy my many hobbies in earnest and even hoped to pursue some new ones. 
I took a trip to Scotland. I learned to knit. And I started reading all those novels that had waited patiently on my bookshelf. I took bike rides and walks and got back into my kayak. But there was also this nagging, invisible weight that I couldn't seem to shake. Some days, I just wanted to lay on the couch and watch mindless TV. At times, I didn't have energy to get together with friends. Just prior to my retirement, my parents bought a house adjacent to what we now know is the small 23 and a half acre remnant called Mealy Prairie. My dad, after making some inquiries with the Prairie Enthusiasts Organization, learned that this piece of land was to be managed through a conservation easement with the Maley family and was in dire need of restoration. Having never done any type of restorative land work before and knowing nothing about prairies, certainly, I nevertheless decided to join him along with my husband, Rick. The personal transformation I experienced over the next several months is something that I find difficult to put into words. It turns out that I truly hadn't done enough throughout my career to deal with the accumulated stress and anxiety that comes from a long career in policing. In the weeks and months after retirement, I discovered that these feelings had been quietly building, buried deep within, and were now bubbling to the surface. The more I worked on the prairie alone with my thoughts, the more these feelings of grief, anxiety, and stress started to flow out of me. I found myself reliving painfully memorable experiences at just the oddest moments, and I would cry at the drop of a hat while pulling invasive weeds or cutting honeysuckle. These were not the feelings I was expecting at all. One fateful day, a good friend who knew nothing of what I was experiencing recommended a book called Braiding Sweetgrass by Dr. Robin Wall Kimmerer. I read the book from beginning to end and then went back and read it again. I wondered aloud, how did this author and wise woman seem to know what I was experiencing, articulating exactly what was happening to me as if she knew me personally? The quote from her book that broke the code for me was, action on behalf of life transforms. Because the relationship between self and the world is reciprocal, it is not a question of first getting enlightened or saved and then acting. As we work to heal the earth, the earth heals us. By helping to restore remnant Maley Prairie, The land was, in turn, absorbing my blood, sweat, and literal tears into the soil, helping me to heal as well. After several months of working on the prairie, I was sleeping more deeply, had more energy, and above all, had found a new purpose in my life. Never did I see myself going into classrooms and teaching students about the importance of prairie habitat. Never in a million years did I see myself becoming a mentor of students who were collecting monarch butterfly data. Never did I see myself using my budding photography skills to capture images of Mealy Prairie and using them to educate our community. I am inspired every day by the gifts that Mealy Prairie continues to bestow upon me and my community. And in turn, I reciprocate those gifts by continuing our work in healing the land and advocating for the preservation of these rare remnant prairies. And should my life story ever take me away from Sauk County, and I really hope it doesn't, Mealy Prairie will forever be imprinted on my heart and I will always, always be grateful for the sacred bond we created together. It was 80 degrees on my way over here at 8 a.m. Well, here's a couple of things I was thinking of. Okay. It looks like you and Rick did a really good job on the Dame's Rocket. I understand you guys were pulling it again yesterday. I'd rather, I I don't want to go into the jungle today. So here were some thoughts. One was 
trail maintenance. You know, we cut a bunch of stuff right. and took some trails through some slash that are not that easy to walk through. Okay. So we could follow the trail with a rake and a loppers and cut stumps and okay. rake paths. I was thinking we could start on the fence line. We've been talking about removing the barbed wire from the north end and cleaning up the fence line of regrowth. There's still plenty, plenty of regrowth to cut along the north-south path that runs down the middle between the prairie and the jungle. Yeah. Is like, we'll be there all summer. So we yeah. could work down there too. We could work there, or we can work straight behind the house. There's honeysuckle. enjoyed listening to Maley Prairie in their own words as much as I did in putting it together. Nature Revisited would like to thank Amy Chamberlain, Rick Chamberlain, Kurt Meany, Patrick Lee, Paul Anderson, Brandon Mann, Mike Mossman, Angus Mossman, and the students from Sauk Prairie High School and a special thanks to Barbara Maley for their participation in this project and for making Maley Prairie such a special place. The music for this episode is Karen by Ben Cosgrove from his album, The Trouble with Wilderness. If you enjoyed this episode, please share it with friends, family, and colleagues. You can follow Nature Revisited on Instagram, YouTube, or our website, nordenproductions.com. That's Norden, N-O-O-R-D-E-N, productions.com. Nature Revisited is produced by Stefan Van Norden and Charles Gagan. I hope you will join us for the next edition of Nature Revisited. And in the meantime, remember, we are nature. <laughs>